السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. I can't stand these sessions because بعد الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله. That was so awesome. Now I don't know what to say. Like I had my entire speech planned out, but now I'm just thinking about what he said and completely lost. But anyway, I will try to inshallah ta'ala give you some reminder or some recollections of what I did want to share with you. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh Abdul Nasser. One of the things I want to start with actually is an acknowledgement. You felt bad being a scholar, speaking in front of you know Dr. Yusuf, and where am I supposed to fit now? So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's that's highly inappropriate uh, that I should be speaking here. But anyway, it's a blessing from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. It's a pleasure. It's also an honor to be here and to have the opportunity to engage in a reminder for myself and all of you and to benefit from this wonderful company. And I ask first and foremost that Allah counts this as an act of worship and an act of ibadah that is accepted before Him and it counts on our record on judgment day and this is something that we bring to Allah as a shahada. Uh, the brief reminder that I wanted to share with you is kind of connected to what Shaykh Abdul Nasser was talking about in terms of family but in a, in a broader sense. And it's just a simple reflection and an ayah in which Allah Azza wa is giving counsel to His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Messenger Sallallahu gives counsel to the world. Who does he get counsel from? He gets counsel from Allah. He was at one point concerned about not being able to remember the Qur'an that is being revealed to him. He was concerned that he won't be able to recall all the ayat that have been revealed. So Allah Azza wa told him, سَنُقْرِئُكَ فَلَا تَنْسَى we will make you read, then you won't forget. Which is beautiful because the Messenger himself, alayhi salatu wasalam, kama qal ma ana bi qali, I'm not, a, I'm not one to read, is what he said himself. So Allah said, don't worry, we'll make you read. He didn't say, you will read and you won't forget. He said, we'll make you read. Because he, he wasn't able to read himself. And then he said, since the Divine will make you read, you won't forget then. Fala tansa. And in the same passage, Allah azza wa jal goes further and then he. The, the first part was, you won't forget, we'll make you read. And then at, right after that he says, in the, in the next discussion, فَذَكِّرْ Then remind. Now that you won't forget, now that you will remember forever, what you have remembered now, you must take that and remind. Now that you have the input, now it's time for the output. SubhanAllah, فَذَكِّرْ إِنَّ فَعَةِ الذِّكْرَى And in just those words, ذَكِّرْ ذَكَّرَى in Arabic, you know, it's it's a muta'addi, it's transitive. What that means is, when you say the word remind, you're expecting an object of the verb. You're expecting, remind who? Remind people. Remind everyone. Remind your family. There's some object expected in the language. But there's no maf'ul bihi there. فَذَكِّرْ Remind. It is as though the Messenger وسلم, is being told, don't worry about it. Don't worry about who's listening and who's not listening. Don't worry about whether they attend or don't, don't attend. Don't worry about who's walking in and walking out. Don't worry about who's making fun of you, who's making you know, snickers, comments about your, what you're saying. Don't worry about people who listen to you, smirk and walk away, come back the next day and insult you and walk away. Don't worry, don't worry about them. Your focus is not the object. Your focus is the verb itself. Remind. You just remind. And then Allah Azza wa Jalla says, إِنَّ فَعَتِ ذِكْرَ This is an interesting structure. Because, you know, a conditional statement in English, we say if and then statements, you ever heard of that? If and then statements? The then part came first, the if came later. فَذَكِرْ is the then part. إِنَّ فَعَةِ الذِّكْرَ is the if part. It's reversed. Because that then part is just that important. It is just that important, that it should be mentioned first, subhanAllah. And he says, if reminder serves to have a benefit. And you know what's interesting about that language, if reminder has benefit. Once again, when you talk about benefit, you have to mention who does it benefit. There's no mention of who it benefits. You know what this tells us? It tells us first of all, our reminder has no restrictions. The, the, this, one of the fundamental functions of this book is reminder. And much of the Islamic services we talk about, whether it's in the realm of education or social services or counsel, can pretty much all be boiled down to reminder. Down to the fundamental pillars of our deen, essentially all of them are an act of remembrance. All of them. Salah is an act of remembrance. Hajj is an ultimate act of remembrance. Fasting is a month of remembrance. All of the fundamentals of our deen are acts of remembrance. Zakah is an act of remembrance in and of itself. Remembering where wealth comes from and where it actually is supposed to go and when you're going to withdraw it. It's an act of remembrance. 
And then above and beyond all of that, the Quran itself is called dhikr. In huwa illa dhikrun, kalla innaha tathkira. In and of itself it's remembrance. What I'm trying to get at is the heart of the message of this deen is once first benefiting from reminder, and then the other delivering reminder, giving others a reminder. Whether it's a social worker giving a married, married couple that are having trouble counsel, even he's giving them a reminder about who created them and how they're supposed to have mercy towards each other. This is something we cannot lose sight of. And as part of that reminder, I want to share something with you. One of the descriptions of the Prophet ﷺ from numerous Sahaba is that he was always smiling. And it makes you think, what vacation was he on that he was smiling? What stress-free time did he enjoy that he was smiling? You and I are smiling when the job is done. Ah, I just finished. Ah. You know, you should see me after Sunday. When I, every Sunday I give my students a really tough exam. By the time the exam is done, I'm done proctoring it. You know, I'm smiling. They're not smiling, but I'm smiling, right? Because I'm done. The, there's, a, there's a smirk on your face as the clock hits 5 o'clock at the office, you know? Especially when it's Friday, when you're done. The messenger is not done, sallallahu alayhi wa As was just mentioned, the weight of the world lies on his shoulder and yet he can maintain consistently his smile. You know what that teaches us? No matter how, you, we could give months of speeches on the problems in the Muslim world and the attacks that are waging against Islam and all the negativity surrounding us. But it, it won't compare to the problems that were waged against the cause of Allah's Messenger in his own lifetime, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And yet, it doesn't prevent him from smiling. It doesn't prevent him. We need to become positive. We need to stop being depressed. We need to stop looking like we're socially constipated, mind the term. Right? When we walk into the masjid. When we meet each other. Sisters stop, need to stop looking like they belong to a mafia and somebody else walks in and they're first like... You know... That, that look needs to go away. Our youth need to, they, they need to learn to smile. It's almost become a thing of pride to not smile. Like, like you got a bug on your face and that's supposed to be, mean you got respect or something. Nobody enjoys more respect than Allah's Messenger and He smiles, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But if the smile is the outwardly. There's something on the inside. With all the sadnesses that may be there, there is this joy that He receives the word of Allah. And it overshadows all the sadnesses. When, you, when somebody smiles, it's not fake. The messenger's smile is not fake. It's not just on the face and not in the heart. Because we do that to each other. <laughs> how are you, brother? You know? And we don't mean it at all. We don't mean how are you, and we don't mean brother. <laughs> but when the messenger smiles, there's something really to be joyous about. And in regards to the Qur'an, Allah tells us, Because of that, you should be overjoyed. You should be overjoyed. What Allah has given us, the deal Allah has given us, فَاسْتَبِشِرُوا بِبَيْعِكُمْ الَّذِي بَيَعْتُمْ بِهِ Right? You should be overjoyed. And if we're not, we're not happy, and if we're not, you know, you know, congratulating ourselves with this great gift Allah has given us, how are we going to take this positive energy of this deen and transmit it to anybody else? How are we going to do that? If people just see us as a religion of frowns, as a religion of just fire and brimstone, how are we going to do that? How are we going to communicate that this deen brings happiness and light to your life? And when you look at the, the face of an average Muslim, it seems like the more religious they get, more dhulumat show up on the face. You know, they just get darker and the frown gets tougher and you know, more intolerant. You know, these are... And then, and then the audacity to say that's closer to the sunnah. Wow, where did that sunnah come from? I don't know what you're reading. But that's not a sunnah. That's not being more religious. You know, usually becoming more religious in sociology is associated with becoming more rigid, becoming more extreme. And in our deen, it's reverse engineer. The more, the closer you come to this deen, the more you learn about this deen, the more you learn, learn about this man, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. It automatically makes you a better person, a kinder person, a happier person, also an easier to deal with person, an ethical person. This is what it makes you. It should naturally have that effect on you. You should have a sense of humor, it's not haram, it's okay to smile, you know. And we have to, we, we are the people that have to change this culture. Unfortunately, I've seen this way too much. We, first of all, we, it's our attitude towards massaging. You know, we've talked about the home, so I'm going to make a comment about massaging, that I'll, I'll be on my way, just talking about the spirit of Islam. The massaging, subhanAllah, in our times, are just strange, become strange places. I love the house of Allah, but when you go there and a couple of children are running around and there are people whose 
They're about to have a heart attack because children are smiling in the masjid. <laughs> hey! No happiness here. It's Jumma time. You know? And then you wonder why these kids never show up ever again when they become teenagers and they have their own car. The last place they'll ever be is at the masjid. Because what do they remember from the masjid? Dude, there was a guy there who acted like a prison warden. I think he was our Sunday school principal. No, if, if there's one here, I'm sorry. <laughs> right? But that's not supposed to be the, the, the atmosphere of Allah's house. We're supposed to bring positive vibes there. We're supposed to go there to feel good. And not just ourselves, we're su masajid are supposed to be so welcoming that non-Muslims with their problems, who, who are in the shades of darkness, come to us for light. How are we going to give anybody else light if we ourselves are in this state? How are we going to do that? The first job, of, the first responsibility have, we have is fixing the matters of the home. And the very next job is fixing the matters of our masajid. Conferences, ins educational institutions, you know, seminars, programs, lectures, trips, all of these things will be there. But the institution that Allah created, that will always be the fixture of how a Muslim community operates and will operate in the future, is the house of Allah. So when we talk about cleaning your house, it's talking about cleaning your home and the house of Allah. These are both homes. And we have to fix those. If we don't address the issues in the masjid, and we don't make them a place that's welcoming for family, welcoming for youth, it's not a place where you're being judged for how you're dressing, you're not being judged for what you know and what you don't know. You're not being judged for the way you pray. You're not being judged for your accent, the color of your skin. You know, you're not being judged for these things. You're not being sized up when you walk in. And if that is the case, then there's still a serious problem that, that you know what that practically means? We only have empty speech to offer everybody else. That's all that means. That we're just empty talk. We don't really represent the beautiful teachings of our deen. So we have to address these things. We can speak in abstract, you know, high things, but I think it, along the spirit of what our dear Shaykh Abdul Nasir said, we have to come back to reality. We have to deal with what is in front of us. When we talk about fixing the problems of the world, it doesn't start unless we fix the problems we have ourselves. We have to start with ourselves. And we have to be positive. And you cannot have the depressed attitude, oh, nothing's going to change. It hasn't changed so far, so it ain't going to change. No, it will change. You have to be positive. You have to, the change does not come from you and me, change comes from Allah. And Allah can change people's hearts. Allah can change their hearts. So Allah is in control of all things, you have to have that reliance. And because Allah is in control of issues, there's no need to be negative. There's no need to be depressed. You know? This is the promise of Allah in the worst times, in the worst times of the seerah. The messenger is being told Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the believers are being told Uhud was one of the worst times. The loss in Uhud, one of the worst times. And what does Allah say, I conclude with it? وَلَا تَهِنُوا وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا What are you worried about? Don't worry about it. Don't be weakened, don't be grieved. You know, Hussain, don't have it. Wahin, don't have it. You're going to be supreme, relax. All you got to do is what? In kuntum mu'min, if in fact you're true believers. So just leave it to the, 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 you know, leave your griefs with Allah. Leave your concerns with Allah. In the worst situation, they're injured, they're bleeding. They have to make their way up the mountain. Is إِذْ تُسْعِدُونَ وَلَا تَلْبُونَ عَلَىٰ أَحَدٍ You're climbing up the mountain, you're not even looking back for your fellow comrades. It's that bad the situation. That's how bad it got. And even then Allah says, don't, don't worry. We have nothing in comparison. We got it pretty good. We have plenty of reasons to be happy. We have plenty of reasons to be grateful. I pray that Allah Azza wa makes us of a grateful nation and that our gratitude translates into positive energy in our family, in our community, and all around us. And I hope that we're able to sustain that energy and encourage each other by means of it and not be the, the, you know, the, the bearer of sadness and depression and negativity towards one another. Rather, when we meet each other, we increase each other in our positive energy, inshaAllah.